time Dr. Berger, he was supported very much by people of regardless of the caste we were born in. So the key thing is that, is that we wanted to understand what the issues are and then how can we move forward collectively. You may also be wondering why are we having this conversation in Canada? Uh, uh, the reason we wanted to have this dialogue is, is that we wanted to be proactive, right? And uh, uh, when we look at the demographics, uh, there's a, a South Asian diaspora is increasing every year. More and more people from the Indian origin are living outside of India. As Baba said, Dr. Ambedkar has said, the caste follows, whether people like it or not, that's, that's the pattern. So we know caste is going to follow. What we have also seen <coughs> is that in uh, England, for example, uh, many challenges came, many issues came, and then the, the advocacy group, they had to work with government and pass legislations. So we wanted to learn from what is happening. We want to understand what the consequences could be, so that we wanted to take some proactive measures. That's, the, that's our intention. So just wanted to say thank you for being part of this conversation, so you can help us as well to understand where we go from Canada in uh, uh, 1897 or thereabouts. So, and then, and then among the so-called Dalit or formerly known, known as untouchable uh, communities, we did some research and to our knowledge, the first family who came to Canada from the Dalit community right here in 1906. And I'm really pleased uh, to acknowledge and uh, welcome one of the uh, uh, descendants from of the of the Dalek pioneer family, who is on this panel. This is uh, Anita. <laughs> so Anita, you're carrying the torch that your <laughs> grandparents, grand great grandparents, probably were carrying over 100 years ago. In terms of the numbers, uh, the numbers are very hard to tell. The latest development that we have seen here is at UBC is that is that the students here, with the help of the faculty, started Dr. Bethel Reading Group, and I'm pleased to see that the, the group is uh, is represented here. So this is a new development and uh, uh, harsh, and Ajay did a lot of work. I also wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge and say that, that uh, with partnership of uh, UBC, particularly uh, various departments here, ANS department, and uh, uh, there are other departments from UBC, uh, and the department from St. Teresa University, Dr. Harish Sharma Foundation, and Chatham Association. In, in 2016, we formalized an agreement, and we, we started hosting uh, Dr. Bethger uh, annual memorial. In 2003, uh, we hosted the uh, International Dalit Conference uh, in Surrey, and about 400 uh, delegates uh, came from all over the world, and uh, about 300 of them were from India. And uh, the purpose of that was to look at privatization, uh, some of the threats of the social welfare programs uh, uh, that were in place, and uh, the impact of globalization and liberalization, some of those policies we're having on the affirmative action programs. Uh, just wanted to also acknowledge that, that primarily the work that we've been doing uh, is is, uh, is about increasing awareness, and I think I think we're making uh, a success. <coughs> and uh, the number of parliamentarians, whether they're MPs or local uh, uh, ministers in the provincial level, uh, they have taken it to the to the legislatures, and and uh, uh, they have acknowledged who Dr. Becker was, so who Dr. Das was, and then that part has now become part of the hands. Some of the challenges, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, stigma, you know, how do you overcome the, uh, the stigma? There's also uh, uh, a fear, I would say, maybe quote unquote, fear of being, you know, taken over, uh, appropriated. And you probably, you might have heard some terms that Dr. Ambedkar has now been appropriated by the uh, Hindutva uh, forces and others. Similarly, so, so just wanted to say that that, that that there is a push and pull because on the one hand we want to take the movement at the national level at the international level but at the same time sometimes we get afraid that the, that the work that we wanted to do that the work that we're doing 
are we gonna still be able to continue if it is uh, misappropriated? Uh, sports on the mainstream, uh, as I mentioned, it is increasing, but it's not at the same pace uh, as we would like to see. Uh, 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 I tease Ajay uh, and say, brother, you, are, you you become a bridge for us, you know, and then we need to create more more bridges, you know, so that, that we can make this as not just an issue of one community, but it's a, it's a, it's a challenge and issue for the, for the entire society. Incidents of harassment, derogatory comments, they continue to happen. And uh, unfortunately, people don't speak about it, but uh, there are times when they do, and then there have been at least three reported situations where those incidents happened. Uh, the media became involved, uh, they raised the profile, and then in two of those situations, people ended up apologizing and then, and then uh, 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 the issue got resolved. That we have heard uh, yeah, that comes up from, from the youth, uh, 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 some of these forums that we have held, they, 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 that it's really not an issue for the, for the youngsters until they start, they're, they're, they're at, at an age, you know, where they start digging, you know, they start seeing people from the opposite uh, set. And it's not a fear or concern for them, it usually is a fear and concern for their parents. Because then they start wondering, hmm, we've been friends with this family, but they're from different house. We should no longer be socializing with them. And then I, th I think, I think that that's an area uh, we're seeing uh, where issues are uh, coming, uh, coming through. So, so, so I, as I said, this is a sensitive issue. I don't want to make this as a, as a, as a, as a serious, but I think, I think, I think uh, it is a serious issue. We need to treat it as, as seriously. But I was really fortunate that I found one uh, video clip, you know, which looks at this issue, and then, and then it, 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 it uses humor to make a point. So I'll, I'll, I'll start this uh, video, and then it's about five minutes, uh, a long video, and then, and then, uh, and then I will conclude my. Here's a one of her daughters went to visit a friend, a new friend, uh, to her house, and she was about 12 years old. And she, the friend's mother said, this has nothing to do with marriage or anything at that time, but she just said, you know, to Siki Hunil. So in Punjabi, she said, what are you? And the daughter felt like saying, she said, I thought, human, I guess. So <laughs> she didn't know what she, she actually said, what do you mean? But she didn't understand what she means by to Siki Hunil, what are you? And then she said, "Oh, what, uh, what do your, fa what does your family do?" And she said, uh, "Are you?" And the woman continued and said, "Are you Jat? Uh, are you a farmer?" And she, the girl, my niece replied, "No, no, we're not farmers. We're not Jat because we own an apartment." <laughs> so <laughs> she actually had, you know, the location wasn't there for her. And my sister, when she came home, my sister was actually, you know, saying, "Oh, no, no, you should have told her you're a Jat." And we all looked at her and said, "Are you stupid? Like, stop telling your daughter this. It's lovely." that she doesn't know this shit, like, stop it. <laughs> so, in a sense, uh, at least in my family, we've grown up not really, um, we've addressed caste, we talk about caste, it needs to be talked about, we need to understand it, but it doesn't have relevance. And I'm sure that a lot of you who are born here in Canada, for us, our last names signify our uh, caste, right? A lot of us can tell from the last name, but if you're born in Canada, bloody hell, you can't tell who's what, and you're going to ask them before you fall in love with them? So, of course, it raises its ugly head at marriage, and it, it raises in politics. It also comes up in politics. I live in Abbotsford, and I know some of you don't have, probably think I saw that video of Abbotsford. And being born and raised in Canada, um, as Jay mentioned, my family is uh, one of the first Dalit or Chamar families to ever come to Canada. In 1906, my great-grandfather was one of two Chamars that were on the boat that made it here. And um, over the years, he brought over our family, and. My mom was born in India, but raised here. Um, and then from my dad's side of the family, his family actually came over in 1908. So from both sides, we have deep roots here in Canada. And growing up, we were born and raised in a small little town up north called Quinal, had a small Indian community. Um, and I was there till I was 14, and I can say I never actually ran across any sort of caste discrimination. Um, most of the people there were judged. Right? But, and they would have known what we were simply because my parents were there. That sort of communication happened with the elders. But us as children and me and my siblings, um, I can't say I was ever called a Chamad or a Chamadi or anything discriminated against. I even moved to Abbotsford at 14. And that was the first time I ever actually heard about caste. So I went home and asked my grandma, <laughs> I'm like, what caste are we? And she just looked at me like, what? 
and I'm like, do we say gay or gil? Right? Do I say and that's water and that's the, the division of the river. And she looked at me like I'd just grown another head. She's like, No, you're Canadian. Everybody is equal. The gurus under Sikhi said we're all equal. We don't believe in that. We don't we don't follow that. And if you're hanging around with kids at Duke, you shouldn't. And I was like, Okay, so then slowly I was fourteen and I started putting pieces together. Okay, so where's Jamaat? Like my family from my dad's side. Um, my dad's cousin was one of the pioneers in getting that Guru Ravi Das Gurdwara started. So I was like, oh, we go to that Gurdwara. Oh, that's what that is. Okay, I get it. But um, our experience growing up, like even my siblings never actually had that direct discrimination. We would kind of laugh about it because we never had any negative connection to being Chama. Right? Within our family, no, it was like, we're a pioneer family. We're, we came here in 1906, right? There was a lot of pride around that. Um, a few years ago, about six years ago, started working in community, became um, involved with this organization called BIBC, where they use arts to create community, right? To break down bridges, bring community together, um, bridge gaps. And in that space, I started learning about systematic racism, right? So white privilege actually is about what it looks like. And at that same time, I also started hearing stories within my own family actually of caste discrimination in the generation that came after me. So I mean, I was born in the late 70s, grew up in the 80s and 90s, and now I had cousins and nieces that were in their early 20s, so they were born in the late 90s, um, who were actually facing caste discrimination in Vancouver, in Victoria, in like big metropolitan cities. And I was like, really? And so I started hearing stories, like one of them is dating somebody. I uh, took Punjabi 403 with Dr. Murphy, and from there, the dearth of Punjabi literature that we explored, it uh, discussed caste. And we had an opportunity to analyze caste and, and kind of relate to our experiences. So I'll, I'm going to take the angle from a uh, Punjabi literature perspective and intersperse my experiences as well. So Jay talked about how, and you, uh, Anita talked about as well, how you'll have um, second and third generation parents continuing the practice of marrying into one's um, caste and community, but not instilling the rest of the culture, Punjabi culture. And that's one of the things that, uh, one of the aspects of our community that Gurbak Singh, um, a, a writer, tackles in his uh, short story called Vidva Pri. And he tackles the assumption that education, um, by virtue of education, that people continue this the Jatava, they they stop believing in the caste system and kind of how it pervades. But of course, that's not the case. As you'll see, children who would another uh, who would otherwise not have a caste consciousness be told that they need to marry into a specific caste group, uh, and that directly can inform practices, dating practices. And what you'll see is by the time someone is of age to get married, they'll they'll be biased in who they're selecting. And of course, that uh, that's very uh, that, that's not something that should be happening necessarily, um, and yeah, and that's why I think there there needs to be an emphasis on developing a caste consciousness as opposed to just pushing away the issue and saying caste doesn't exist, caste discrimination does not exist, um, and that by doing that, you're kind of reproducing or transposing that colorblind rhetoric or all lives matter rhetoric mm -hmm. into a caste context. And that's, uh, and that's dangerous, and that's not something we would want to produce. Um, another story that uh, I can talk about here is um, uh, it's called Vichkarli Sarak by um, uh, Harpreet Singh Seka. It's a great story, and it talks about how caste inserts itself into what otherwise would be a unified Punjabi. And what you see is how these families who are living next to one another, and they've immigrated at the same time, when it comes to the issue of caste, they've been living while well, they have cultural similarities, but when it comes to marrying and they're two of two different castes, there is a division. There's that internal fissure that comes up. But in the case of racial discrimination, or what we'll pose to the greater community is that we're a unified Punjabi front, but there's still these internal fissures that need to be tackled. And that's one of the main things that, uh, especially growing up as a youth, there needs to be that sort of education that occurs. and. Um, I think by virtue of migration patterns, the majority population of Punjabi people here is Jat. So that's sort of reflected in music and pop culture and facets of Punjabi culture. But I think there is a place for acknowledging one's ethnic tribal heritage and history, but it, when it bleeds into that chauvinism, 
that, you know... Um, so, I'm in the early stages of my research, and uh, the, the presentation that I have today will be a series of questions that I'm thinking through, and I uh, would love to start a uh, conversation, and it really extends a lot of Jay's uh, presentation in terms of the amazing and incredible activism and community work that he's been doing, and also I want to acknowledge that it's such a privilege to be on this panel with uh, people who um, do this work on a regular basis. So. Um, just a bit of a background, and I'm going to be brief, uh, just because I know I want to make sure that we have time for a conversation. Um, so Jay mentioned uh, Dr. Baker's work, and uh, many of us know this, um, but Dr. Baker, affectionately known as Baba Sab, was a visionary jurist, social reformer, and politician, also known as the father of the Indian Constitution. And um, he is also uh, one of the mo he's written some of the most well-researched and thoughtful structural critiques of caste including his work, Annihilation of Caste. Um, and in it, he writes, quote, there cannot be a more degrading system of social organization than the caste system. It is a system that uh, deadens, paralyzes, and cripples the people from helpful activity. Uh, and then he also describes caste as an <coughs> enclosed class, something that's endogamous, which I'll talk a bit about uh, later on. And um, uh, the, the word caste, though, is uh, not necessarily unique to the South Asian context, but is imported through uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese, the term casta, uh, which means race, breed, or lineage. So um, traditionally, caste in India gets mapped on uh, through this uh, idea of Brahmins at the top and Dalits and Adivasis at the bottom. Um, and so uh, there's this kind of Hindu uh, Brahminical, uh, patriarchal way in which uh, caste is understood, and um, so this is the kind of dominant narrative, the kind of mainstream narrative around caste. Um, but caste uh, is something that emerges regionally and uh, is something that is constantly shifting. So, for instance, my research is looking specifically at caste in Punjab and the Punjabi diaspora. Um, so caste in Punjab is a bit different than it is uh, elsewhere in India because it's predominantly organized around land ownership and it doesn't necessarily map neatly into the kind of Brahminical organization of the Brahmins and the Dalits. So um, there's this kind of uh, move away from the pollution purity hierarchy that is very common in the more dominant narrative around caste. Um, so in Punjab we have different caste groups. Uh, and um, specifically, uh, the, the kind of largest caste group are the Juts, um, the, the biggest in terms of uh, numbers. And uh, there's also the lower caste groups, the Mazbi Dalits, who um, uh, again, <coughs> these kind of uh, communities get uh, uh, marked in very particular ways. So um, these are kind of occupational uh, understandings of these communities, but um, we know that some of the terminology that is used for low caste uh, Punjabi uh, Dalits gets used in derogatory ways as well. So it's just how um, caste has been appropriated in the community. So um, this is kind of the organization in Punjab, but uh, I wanted to see in my research what happens when caste travels, and uh, we saw a bit of that in the film, and um, uh, I'm trying to understand how does it get mapped.